Okay. So uh, so you guys didn't see the error. And what the error was, PowerShell actually had a small s in it. And I always say it's not a small shell, it's a big shell. So it's uh, the proper case for it is PowerShell with a, a capital P and a capital S. But anyway, uh, I've already talked about what we're going to be covering today. So you've seen the first slide there. And uh, so a little bit about me. You're not here to learn about me. You're here to learn about operational validation and, and pester. But uh, I'm Mike F. Robbins. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a Microsoft MVP. I'm a uh, Safety and Technologies MVP. I'm leader and co-founder of the Mississippi PowerShell User Group, co-author of Windows PowerShell TFM 4th Edition, author of Chapter 6 in the PowerShell Deep Dives book, and winner of the advanced category in the 2013 scripting games. And as I said, you, di you didn't come here to learn about me, but if you're interested, I blog at MikeFRobbins.com, and you can learn more about me there. I've got over 400 blog articles on PowerShell, been blogging since 2009, and I typically publish a blog article every week about the most interesting thing that I've, I've actually used at work in a production environment for that week. Okay, so Pester. You may or may not have heard of Pester in the past, but Pester is a unit testing framework for PowerShell, and it's actually open source. It, it ships, it's the first open source piece of software that ships with Windows 10, or at least that's my understanding. And we're going to be using what's called assertions, and there's a should assertion that we're going to be using throughout the code. And we're going to cover all of this in much more detail when I get to the code examples. But Pester also allows for mocking. I'm not going to cover mocking today, but it's a, it really is a, a fully featured test framework. So you can also do isolated file operations with Pester, and there's a test drive drive that you can actually uh, man manipulate files, and then the drive just goes away. So you could copy files to that test drive, and then you can make modifications to them. And it's for you can actually run a command and simulate the testing without, say, deleting the uh, production files off your hard drive. So you can make sure the command's going to do what you think it's going to do before you actually run it in a, a, even a test environment. So you can also test modules. And that doesn't sound real advanced, but it actually is much more advanced than, uh, than it sounds. You can, of course, test public functions. But within the scope of a module, you can also test private functions that are not externally exposed, which is a really neat feature. So for more information about Pester, you can go out to their wiki on GitHub. And I've got a slide coming up. All this, all the content in my session today has already been published to my uh, presentations repository on GitHub. So test-driven development, that's actually what, what I use Pester for. And today, that, that's not the focus today, but you really need to understand that model because you need to understand PowerShell and you also need to understand Pester. And in addition to that, you need to understand the test-driven development model. Okay, and this is, a, uh, this is actually an image here that I, I designed and it's, it's in a blog article that I had written. So what you do is you actually start and you add a unit test, a failing unit test that's real simple, and you write just enough code for your function or script or whatever you're doing or your, your operational validation test until the, uh, the, until the unit test fails. And then you just keep repeating until you're done. I mean, it's really simple. So operational validation testing, which is what the session here today is about. So you need to understand, like I said before, PowerShell, Pester, and depend, depending on what languages you're going to use with your, uh, your testing, you may also want to know Transact SQL, but for this audience, I don't think that'll be an issue. And maybe you want to get some machine-specific things that you can only get from WMI. And of course, you can use the sim, the newer sim commandlets for doing that. But you, uh, of course, WMI is a separate, separate language from PowerShell and Transact SQL and all these others. There's an operation validation framework that uh, that Jim Truer on the PowerShell team has written that is available on GitHub, and I've got links to all this, and I'll show a brief example of that. It's 
the operational validation framework is actually built on top of Pester, so it uses Pester and it gives you a little bit better output that you can actually uh, send to other systems. Um, it's not just outputting data to the screen, but you can also output objects with Pester as well. So, and of course you can use other third-party products. So let's go ahead and get started with the demo, and there's the, uh, the URL for my GitHub repository. I think I'll, the majority of the presentations I've done this year, I, I think I started back in March, I started putting all my presentation content on GitHub, so, uh, so that's where you can find it. Uh, I did a SQL presentation at the PowerShell Summit this year that's really interesting to the SQL community. There's a, a video on, uh, on my YouTube channel and the, the content for it is out there as well. Okay, so I'm going to start out on my local machine because I'm going to show you Pester for it first because if you don't understand Pester then you really can't use it for operational validation. And I've, I've, uh, the screen size is 150% uh, percent, so that should be large enough for everyone to see. I just want to make sure I've got, um, got everything set here. So if you don't have Pester installed, if you're running like Windows 8.1 or whatever, if you've got PowerShell 5 or if you've got the, uh, if you've added the PowerShell Get module to your, to your um, Windows or to PowerShell, you can actually install the Pester module from PowerShell. Now I've added the force parameter here because even if you have Pester on Windows 10, there's numerous there's numerous updates to Pester, and the force parameter will actually allow you to update that that module to the latest version. Because hey, the Mike, one would you just, mind bumping your uh, sure. font size up just as mentioned? Sure, sure. Let's go up to 175 on here. And you can see I actually had in the uh, maybe Thanks, larger Mike. than that. Okay. No, that's great. Okay, so I'll save that. And any updates we make, this is actually the code that's sitting in my GitHub re local repository on my machine. So any changes we make during this presentation, I'll, I'll push an update up to, the, to GitHub. Okay, so I've already installed the latest updates. So I'm not, actually not going to run this command. But I'll show you all the different Pester versions that exist on my machine. So I think 3.3.5 is what ships with Windows 10. And you can see I've had numerous updates since then. I would go ahead and pull down the latest version, but if you have existing unit tests or operational validation tests, you'll probably want to test it. I don't know of anything that's been broken in newer versions, but if you happen to be using something like PowerShell version 2, then you know support for that may be dropped in newer versions, of course. Okay, so I'll just show you the commands that exist in the... Uh, so there's numerous commands. We're only going to use a fraction of these in the... Uh, in the demonstration today. And everything I'm showing you today, like I said before, is, is based on blog articles that I've already written. So I'll just show you uh, the one that we're getting started on. So if you go out to my blog, uh, you can read through all this. It's going to step you through everything. So we're going to create a, a temporary, just a, a pester folder on the local machine, so it's under demo, it's called Pester. And as I walk you through my presentations I've done, or my presentation, I've done a few really unique things that I'm going to point out. So new fixture is one of the commandlets that's part of the Pester module. And what new fixture does, it actually, it'll create a function for you and it'll create the Pester test file, so you'll end up with two files. It basically creates the scaffolding to uh, or a template almost of of getting started with a uh, with a pe with a pester unit test and also a function, which is what the pester is really designed for. So the operational validation is something that the community has started doing with pester, but it's not really what it was designed for. But it works really well. Okay, so as you can see in the output here, it actually created a number parity folder. And it also created uh, two files in that folder. And if I run get child item, you know, on that, you're going to see there's only two files in that folder. So I just want you to know there's nothing, uh, nothing going on behind the scenes. So we we'll just change our location to that folder. 
we'll open up those two files. So there's a uh, there's a function called psedit in the uh, PowerShell ISE. So what you end up with, you end up with a function by the name and and uh, new fixture created this for us. There's no no uh, code within the function, and then you end up with a a very basic unit test, and it's it's a failing unit test because it says true should be should be false. And the, the syntax you're using here for the unit test, the reason I'm showing this and it's so important, you're going to use the same syntax for your operational validation test. So you can run invoke pester. It'll actually execute all the uh, all the files that end in .test.ps1. So if you have numerous if you have numerous tests in the same folder, or and even if they're operational validation tests, it'll actually execute every single one of those. Now there is a I believe a, a script parameter that you can specify, and you can only run one of those scripts. And I'll show you a really neat example of uh, another feature. So what I would recommend is that if you're using Invoke Pester, take a look at the examples and the help, because there's all sort of functionality there that that I haven't seen anybody really use, but it's uh, it's actually very useful. So what I've done, I create a lot of little helper functions, and those helper functions actually, like this one here, is test-driven development workflow. It helps me with my workflow. So what I'm going to do in the we're not going to work in the PowerShell console much, but I just want to show you the workflow. So now the test that exists in the test file right now, it, it's called uh, something useful. So what my helper function did, it actually read that and it says, hey, there's no code to make this test pass. So write code until it passes. So all the code I'm showing today, like that's a custom function, but everything is in my GitHub repository. I'll just show you that real quick. So I have a Mr. Toolkit uh, module that's in my PowerShell repository on GitHub, and it's got all sorts of uh, helper functions in it. And all the, f the way I write my modules is I actually break out the, uh, the functions into separate PS1 files, and then I dot source them from the, uh, from the script module file. So that way, if you just want one function, you can go grab it. Okay, and the whole process here that explains what I'm going to explain here on the video today, it's also documented. And even the, uh, you see the, the, the image that I showed you earlier, but this is the function here, and it actually shows you how I'm using this. So if you want to know more about that specific function, just take a look at that blog article. So what I'm doing here, I'm actually going to be updating the code so I don't have to type all this in. So I'm actually going to update the content of the, uh, the test file. So I'll update the content, and I'm actually running the PowerShell ISC with the ISC steroids module by a... Uh, there's a PowerShell MVP that wrote this module, and it's something that I'm not marketing, you know, for him, but it's something I had to purchase. But it it allows, it's got a lot of additional features, and you can see, hey, it knows I changed this test file outside the ISC, and do I want to reload it? So that's not functionality you get in the default ISC. So I can say yes, and you can see my code was updated. So now it's basically uh, running the get number parity function and it's saying that one should be odd. Like I said, I want to keep this real simple because when we get to the SQL part, which is going to be here in just a couple minutes, I'm going to zip through this. I want to make sure I get all my SQL content covered. But if you don't understand this part, then it, it's very difficult to understand the operational validation portion of it. So if I run invoke pester, you'll see that my test should fail. So this is how test-driven development is designed. You want to write a, a simple failing test, one test, not not all the tests that you want to you want your function to accomplish. So if I took a look at my my uh, workflow here, it's saying, hey, now I need to write code into this this uh, test passes for the one sh should be odd. So I'll go ahead and update my function. 
and what I used here, I'm actually using set content to update the file, and I'm placing it in a here string. So if you wanted to copy this code out of here, you would just copy this. So update the function. It's going to say, hey, you updated that. Notice it's updated. And this way, I'm not having to copy and paste a bunch of code during this presentation. So now I can run invoke pester. So notice my one test passes. And so my workflow now, it actually prompts me with a just a little graphical user interface say, hey, is the code complete? No, it's not. So it's going to tell me write a felon test for a simple feature that doesn't yet exist. So I'll actually say, hey, two should be even. So, and as I said, pester has got a lot of additional functionality. So I'm going to run invoke pester with a pass through parameter at this point. I want you to notice that not only did I, my first test passed, my second test, of course, failed because I haven't written that code yet. And this is a, for the, uh, to get colorized output, this is using write host. So it's only outputting outputting the uh, the green and red to the screen. It's not producing objects. So, but when you use pass through, you actually get objects, and you can see there's a total count of two, and the the pass count was one, and the fail count was one. So if you wanted to output this to another another function or commandlet, then or you wanted to uh, to write this to a, a text file or so on you could actually use the objects here so and that it's very beneficial so anyway we'll write the code to make the next next test pass and what we're doing here to make this work we're using the modulus operator in powershell okay so it says hey it, it changed so you'll notice i only added one more line of code so this time i'm actually going to run invoke pester and i'll so i've written that that failing unit test, and I actually wrote the code so it's going to say, hey, is the code complete? No, it's not. So it wants me to write another one. But I'm going to run invoke pester. So this time, what I did, I specified the quiet parameter in addition to pass through. So that doesn't, it doesn't write to the screen. It only gives the, it gives you the output. So we can see we have two tests and two of them passed. Okay, so negative numbers. So let's run this again. And this could very easily be anything with SQL. You could write a simple function. So, uh, so just humor me for that part of it. That this may not be specific to SQL, but the code is uh, the logic for this is going to be the same regardless. So I'm going to just run invoke pester again, and I'll I'll press enter. So hey, it's it knows that should determine dash one is odd. And the way I'm getting this is that the object-oriented output from Pester is it's actually parsing that and say, hey, this test is failing. So we'll jump up here real quick. And what I've noticed too, it does the uh, even though I've got ISC steroids, it doesn't always update these files because at some point it, they'll be locked and it'll say, hey, you can't you can't update those files. But let's run invoke Pester one more time. So so it should determine one is odd, and with the modulus operator, it, ac it actually doesn't work properly. So we'll go through, so we'll have to refactor our code. So we'll refactor our code. So now we have different code. So this time I'm actually going to pipe the previous in invoke pester instead of running it. No, the code's not complete. And I have multiple monitors, so typically I would actually run this on a separate screen. This time I'll run the, pre the same command that I previously ran. I'm actually going to pipe it to select object and only grab a, grab a few of the properties to show you that I can get the object-oriented output from, from Pester. So you'll notice now we got total count of three, we got pass count of three, and we've actually got a no fail count, no skip count. So by simply dividing by two, I can determine if a number is odd or even. Okay, so maybe I want multiple numbers to be inputted to that. So you'll notice what I'm doing every time is I'm only adding one test. So I'll write this again, or I'll actually update the, uh, the test again. 
and I'll run I'll just run invoke pester so you can see the typical output. So now it's uh it's actually not it's not designed for multiple integers. It's it's wanting a single number. So that's why it's failing. So I can specify, hey, more than one integer, I can put it in a for each loop and and accomplish that task. So we'll go ahead and reload that. We'll run invoke pester again. Notice all the tests pass. And by having this this code here, maybe that functionality is not. Maybe I wrote, wrote some command for SQL Server, and I go back in six months and I add additional functionality. Well, you want to save your unit test because then you can run your unit test, and if you break something that was previously existing, you'll know it because usually you get code that people have written, and even somebody sets up a SQL server and this is where the operational validation testing comes in that nobody wants to touch it. Everybody's afraid to make modifications either to the server or to the code or whatever it is that you're working on because it works and nobody wants to break it by, but by having either unit tests for your code or operational validation tests for your servers you can simply run this and you'll know immediately what I would recommend is run it before you make a change to make sure nothing's been changed that you're not aware of and then run it after your change and you'll immediately know that hey all my previous tests are working and it's really great because if if you walk into an environment where, where you're not familiar with the uh, you didn't build the servers so you want to check and make sure that you've got so many uh, tempdb data files if you've got a certain number of cores you can check all that really quick and what I use this for is really for smoke test. I want it to check it really quick because a lot of times you're mon sure you have monitoring set up, but your monitoring may not be that granular, but also your monitoring, you may get a hundred, say, emails because everything in your data center went down. Well, then how do you know that every single thing came back up? And you can run this and you'll know really quick if everything's up without having to go open your monitoring system and all. So what I want to do, I'm just going to add one. I want to show you a problem with doing these uh, these actual tests. And what I'll do, since the code is making it this large, I can actually highlight this, and it'll run everything in that collapse region there. I can actually expand it now, and it'll be highlighted. So I'll run my invoke pester again, and notice it's, I, I'm actually trying to test pipeline input and it's prompting me because it's a mandatory parameter instead of failing because I haven't written that code yet. So I'm actually going to stop the execution. What you have to do is it needs to run non-interactive. So I can call PowerShell.exe and I'm going to specify no profile because I don't want my profile to load and then I can specify the command to run. So let's clear this screen so we only get this output. So when I run that what I want you to notice is I really should have gotten the green and red output for what failed and what didn't. But what happens is since write host actually only writes to the screen, it wrote to the screen in a different session. And that's why I didn't get the output, but notice I did get the object-oriented output. You'll notice the very last one, there's a negative by it, so I know that that one failed. And in the uh, past, at the bottom here, you'll notice that I'll uh, it actually, this goes with failed, so one failed. Okay, so we're good on time at this point. So I'll write the code for the pipeline input. So what I've done now, I've just added pipeline input in my process block. So I'll run my pester test again. And notice what I did, I actually got, a, I grabbed this old code where I was using a modulus operator. So imagine you implemented a new feature six months down the road and hey, one of your tests that should be passing is no longer passing. So what you'll have to do is figure out, okay, what did I write that broke this part of the code? And then you can go back and refactor your code. Now I'm going to show you a really, really neat feature I haven't seen a lot of people use online or in any videos or anything. I'm going to break this up into multiple describe blocks and this can help with your uh, operational validation test as well. So it's the same test. What I'm saying is, hey, test it with positive numbers, negative numbers, with multiple numbers. 
and maybe uh, maybe have some operational validation tests that you're writing. And maybe some of them take a really long time. Well, the way that this is designed, it's designed to run all the tests in that test file. So it's going to run every one, even if the first one fails. It's not really. You can write some logic to nest things or do conditional tests, but that's not really how it's designed. So if you've got something that's going to take a really long time, you may want to put it in a separate describe block. So now if I just run invoke pasture, it's just going to run the same test. The output is slightly different. I've got a little more pink there that's uh, being outputted, one, one line for each describe block. What I want you to notice is maybe I only want to run one test. So I can specify the name of the, the describe block that I want to run. So I want to run this one that's failing. I don't want to run all these other tests. So I can actually specify the test name and that's the only thing that will run. I'll run one test and that's it. So if I'm troubleshooting that and it takes, it takes five minutes to run all these tests, I can just troubleshoot the code and then run that one test and then that's it. And what I want to show you, maybe your, uh, your boss is like, hey, how's that code going? And you can say, hey, it's going great. You can run the test. I can run the other two tests, the ones that aren't failing. I can run it while he's standing over my shoulder and say, yeah, see, it's all green. It's going great. I just don't run the one that's failing and show it to him until I get it fixed. So let's see. So now we've figured out that, hey, we got a hold of some old code because you really should store your code in source control when maybe for some reason it wasn't updated in source control or whatever. But you figured out that you had some old code and now you're not going to use the modulus operator for this function. So we'll say yes. And of course I could close those and it would quit telling me that they've been updated. So notice everything runs fine. Okay. So, as I said earlier, you want to write the minimum amount of code to make your test pass. So maybe this is not the most efficient way to, uh, to write this function, and I've, I've got the, the code written, but I want to refactor it. So I've got all these tests, I know they work, I'm going to refactor my code to accomplish the same task, but it's a little bit better way of accomplishing the same task. So we'll say yes. And what we're doing now is we're actually using the PowerShell bitwise operator to determine if a uh, number is, is uh, negative or not. So I can run my test and hey, it, work, it still works great. It accomplishes what we want to accomplish. And that's the end of the pester set portion of this. And we're going to jump into the operational validation framework. But you can, you can take a look at the wiki on the pester uh, repository on, on GitHub. And it'll actually tell you how to use all these commands. Okay, so we'll go ahead and collapse this region. Okay, so I'm going to be showing you the operational validation framework that I was telling you about earlier. And I have a blog article that goes through all this in detail, and it actually uses a SQL Server example here. And I, I don't know if you guys have ever run into this problem, but I've had SQL Servers, and especially 2008 R2, and it was before the latest service pack. But the servers, the SQL Server service would be running, the SQL Server agents uh, service would be running. It'd be listening on port 1433, but it wouldn't respond to queries. So I do a really, what I call a really stupid query, is I actually query sys.databases to make sure that there's a database named master. Well, of course, that table exists in master, so uh, it should always return that, you know, it should just say, hey, yeah, but it's something that's really simple and easy and lightweight to say, hey, is my SQL Server listening to queries? And so at this point, we're going to jump to a virtual machine so that I've got access to a couple of SQL servers. And this is the same code that I've been showing you already. So this is going to be more free, free formed. We're not create, we're not using new fixture because we don't want a function. We just want to test. So what I'm going to do, I'm actually going to uh, write my test. And this is a scenario. What I would still recommend is write one test at a time because you want to make sure that your tests are going to fail 
and then make sure that they actually work because uh, there's nothing worse than getting a false positive that a test is successful. Okay, so we'll open up the file that we just created for the test. So it's very simple. Uh, we're actually creating a new session. I, uh, I had a little problem with my demo earlier today and I figured out that my SQL 01 server had wrote a, uh, a DSC resource and I had actually renamed my uh, SQL server with that DSC resource. But anyway, I finally got that figured out. So we can still run invoke pester and you'll notice that the SQL Server service is running, the agent's running, it's listening on 1433, it's able to to query information on the SQL Server and so on. And so the session is not to uh, not to base, not to give you a fish, but teach you how to fish, so that you can you can do this for yourself. So if you have a list of things that you check for your environment that your corporation says this is how we configure our SQL servers, then you can write this sort of test and you can actually run this in your environment. And I've seen other people do similar things, but not with Pester. They would have checks that they would go out and check things on different SQL servers. Okay, so now let's just stop the SQL Server agent on that on that server, and we'll run the pester test again. And this is kind of what I mean by make sure that every single test is going to fail, so we can see now the test for the SQL agent service is failing. And you'll also notice how quickly that this returned, and these are virtual machines running on my laptop. So, uh, so you do want your test to be really quick, like I said before, a, a smoke test. So if I start the SQL Server agent service on this server, you can actually uh, run it again and see now it's successful. So it is, it is actually running the, these tests. So this operational validation framework that I, I showed you, it's, uh, it's written by one of the PowerShell team members, but it's it's uh, open source, it's on GitHub, you can even contribute to it if you find a problem. So I'm actually going to run this. And you'll notice you actually get different output. Now you can, I included the pester output, so you can get the pester output as well. But it'll, it'll tell you all the details. It'll, it'll tell you that, you know, the, the the SQL Server service should be running, and these are all objects, so it gives you a little bit richer output than you get with the uh, with Pester. Okay, so one of the benefits of using a Pester test like this, and I, I mentioned this briefly, so I can write multiple test files, and I can run all those files by simply saying invoke pester. So I can test my SQL server, I can test my application servers, and so on. And that way I'm getting a full test of my environment. Because maybe you have a, like you have a test environment, you have a training environment, you have a production environment. And I, I have some bonus content in this as well, and, and I, I don't plan to get to that in this session, but it's linked to a blog article that's very detailed that actually shows that, and in addition to showing that, you can actually kind of, if you're familiar with desired state configuration, where you're breaking out the structural configuration and the environmental config, you can uh, you can do the same sort of thing with this. So the specifics, like the SQL Server name, maybe you've got different port numbers that are in use for different environments, especially on the application side, you can break all that out into uh, into hash tables. And then in addition to that, it's very easy to store those hash tables in a SQL Server database. Now, you probably don't want to store it in a database on the server that you want to test because, of course, if that server is down, then it's kind of a catch-22. But I've got some blog articles on that. And I, I showed using some of the older functions that were available prior to the, the new SQL Server module coming out, but it's much easier with the, the SQL Server uh, 2016 module that, that came out as part of SQL Server Management Studio. Okay, so one thing you can do is you can actually write your test as a function. So you can put it in a module and you can just call it any, from anywhere. So I'm going to do that. So I'm going to create a function. We'll open up that function just so you can take a look at it. And of course, the one thing that I didn't do to this function is that I didn't write comment-based help, which I should have written, but I mainly wanted you to see the code. So 
I can actually loop through and test multiple SQL servers. And there's a, actually a new feature in, in newer versions of Pester where you can do this without looping through like for each or for each object. But I want to show you this way. So we're going to dot source that function. And then also, uh, so now we're going to test uh, the SQL 011 and SQL 02 servers. So I can actually test multiple servers. And the way that this one is written, now this first server actually has the, uh, the SQL PS module. And it's, so it's actually loading that module on the server itself. And you notice it took a lot longer. And the second server, so it took like 15.3 seconds to uh, query the SQL server. And the second one only took 180 milliseconds because the second one has the SQL server module. And um, I know Aaron and, and Chrissy both were uh, part of getting the uh, the speed problems as far as importing that module fixed. So uh, I appreciate them taking care of that. What I want to show you now is you can, this is very simple. This is something that I, I was showing one of the PowerShell team members my code last week. And he said, hey, there's a new parameter called test cases in newer versions of Pester. And it allows you to test like multiple things. So I can actually loop through multiple SQL servers without going through a for each loop. And I'm just going to check the SQL server service on both of those. And this is a test. It is a uh, operational validation test. So you'll notice, and it was really quick. So I tested two different SQL servers with a minimum amount of code with that test cases parameter. And that's why I say always take a look at the help for, uh, for the commands you're using because with newer versions of the commands, they could add additional functionality that can make your life a lot easier. So I'll show you a couple of the things in the bonus content. And I just want to make sure I've got a few more slides to cover. So be very careful when you're using other cultures. So I want to show you a simple example of this. So when you use .NET methods, and I'm using a, I'm actually using two upper in this test, two upper. Yeah, here you go. So you can see I'm using two upper. Well, that doesn't always translate properly if you're using other cultures. So I'll use the, uh, the Turkish culture. So what I want you to notice here is the I is actually, uh, the Turkish I is different than the uh, English I. So if you're testing in another culture, just be aware of that. And I've got some fixes in the blog article that's referenced there. Uh, I, I kind of showed you writing dynamic unit tests for your PowerShell code with Pester, where you can write it as a function. But this is actually a different example. It's uh, It tests for functions to make sure that I've added uh, the way I write my modules. And I, I showed you already, so they're in separate PS1 files. So it actually tests the module manifest to make sure I've listed all those functions in the, uh, in the functions to export section of the uh, manifest. And then also be mindful of object types when you're performing operational validation. Because if you're comparing a Boolean to a string, we all know that true should not be false. But what I want you to notice is that if the command you're running outputs a different data type, and you SQL guys should be all too familiar with data types, that notice that true is actually equal to false because of the data types. So that that's the scenario where I said make sure you your tests are failing before you run them and make sure they're succeeding. Because if you only make sure they succeed, they may not fail even when things are not configured the way you want them to be configured. I wrote a really detailed, and I actually have the function here. The most detailed test I've written as far as operational readiness testing is, is one that's not SQL related, but it's for Altero VM backup. And they have about 20 things listed that they want you to check this and check that and check something else. So what I did is I actually went through, and you'll notice I wrote a function for this. I put comment-based help in. And it actually goes through, and it checks the Hyper-V host, and it checks the VMs. And it makes sure that everything is configured the way, like your integration services is up to date. And that you have at least 10% free disk space on all the drives. And there's some things in here that you can use, like I was using get WMI object. Let's see. 
and make sure the OS is a certain version and you name it and there's some things that I actually hadn't seen anybody else do before so to get I, I'm actually running VSS admin to make sure that uh, to make sure things are set properly here so I actually used a uh, one of the executables and I'm I'm actually grabbing the output so you don't necessarily have to use just PowerShell commands you can actually write this whatever it takes to get the data you need is what you can use in here as long as you can call it from PowerShell and of course you can use with the different commandlets you can use transact SQL you can use DOS commands as long as you can get the output in a consistent format okay and there's a couple more here Mark, that uh, bye. sure yes sir sorry we We've got a question that, that kind of relevant to what you're talking about right now from Sandra that says, what would be the difference between testing services up and processes state using PESTA or doing it through DSC? Well, one of the differences for DSC is DSC is not designed just to monitor. It's actually designed to configure and then either mon monitor. So you can, uh, you can actually uh, apply the configuration and then monitor, or you can apply it and autocorrect it. So DSC, if you're using DSC, and DSC is also only going to check at most every 15 minutes if you're using a pull server. And maybe I don't want to wait 15 minutes to make sure that everything is configured properly. Uh, so it is a little bit different scenario. It's uh, the operational validation test is I want to run something. I want to know right now what the state of it is. I don't want to wait until DSC runs again. And uh, DSC is also fairly new. Not everybody is using DSC. But DSC, in my mind, is more for configuring the environment. You know, if you're a consultant and you walk into a client and you want to know the state of X, Y, and Z, that this, this, these are the things I need to know on this SQL server. You know, how much free space, how many tempdb files are running. I want to make sure that uh, SQL is not configured to use more than like 95% of the RAM or 90% of the RAM or, or there's X amount of RAM available for the OS. That some of those things, yes, you can configure with DSC, but maybe the customer is not using DSC. So it's, uh, it's to me, this is more like I want to know right now or maybe I want to create a, you can actually use the object-oriented output to get, to create a report and then provide it to the customer to say, hey, your SQL server, you know, maybe you work for somebody that's, uh, that provides a third-party product, and you have to make sure that the client SQL servers are in a certain state. So instead of going through and pointing and clicking in the GUI, when this client's not using DSC, you can just run this script and you can provide it to the client to say, hey, these are the things in your environment that are not, that are not up to par and you need to fix them and then call us back, you know. So, so DSC is really for a different scenario than uh, than operational validation test. And uh, if there's any more questions on that, I'll be happy to answer them. We're uh, nearing the end of this, uh, so I d definitely want to make sure we get any questions answered. So this is the article I was telling you about earlier where you can actually separate the environmental code from the structural code. And then also the other one that you can store and retrieve uh, PowerShell hash tables, which this actually is using... Uh, is using the pre it's kind of a follow-up because I wrote an article to do this and then like the very next week the S SQL Server uh, 2016 module came out and it was so much easier to do it with the built-in commandlets so what I'm going to do at this point is we'll jump back to the uh, to the slide deck Okay, so a few resources. I uh, already mentioned the Pester Wiki on GitHub, the Operational Validation Framework. All these are links if you grab this slide deck. So this points to the GitHub repository. I've actually linked, this doesn't point to PowerShell.org, it points to YouTube and it points to the, uh, the videos they have on Pester. PowerShell Magazine, there's I, I'm, I've actually linked to the uh, Pester tag on PowerShell Magazine. There's some great articles out there also. Some people that actually have, have worked on the code itself in Pester. I noticed there's some on the Hey Scripting Guy blog also. Uh, user groups. I linked this to a new uh, page that was actually, actually uh, recently updated for PowerShell user groups. 
a lot of them are virtual. My user group is virtual as well. Uh, Twitter, this is this links to the uh, Pester uh, Twitter user account. Also blogs, this links to my blog, but I have a blog role on my blog. So it's people that I know that write great code and I've probably got about 15 or 20 links out there. The uh, this There's a Slack channel um, for PowerShell. And then uh, I know that SQL Server, you guys have a Trello board that's really awesome so you can upload different things that you want. And there's my uh, contact info and the books that I've taken part in. There's actually a pro PowerShell for database developers that I actually, uh, I did the technical edits on, on a portion of that book. And it's, uh, it's published by A-Press. But the best way to uh, get a hold of me is probably on Twitter. I probably use that more than anything else. And if you want my email address, I've got a link there. Go out to my About page. My email address is actually encoded on my About page. So you can use PowerShell to decrypt it. It's really easy to decrypt. And, uh, and that's a challenge. And even if you just want to go decrypt it and send me an email. But I think uh, at this point, if we have any other questions, oh, DSC, what does it stand for? It stands for Desired State Configuration. Okay, and I want to thank you guys for, uh, for attending my session today. And this session is, uh, like we said before, it is being recorded. So I'll get that recording to Aaron. and. Uh, and we'll get it posted. And at this point, if there's no further questions, I'll go ahead and turn it back over to Aaron. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Uh, we really appreciate you doing this for us. So, Pester 